day, ladies and gents, and welcome back to DCS World with Mags, and welcome back aboard the F-14 Tomcat by Heat Blur Simulations. Now, for today's flyout, we're going to be playing around with the Phoenix missiles. However, before we get into that, I just want to go over Jester a little bit, because there was a bit of confusion yeah, following the last video on exactly how Jester operates. Jester's radial menus that you see popping up on screen right now are generally not designed to be accessed while you're in direct close range Jester. combat. Instead, these are used to configure Jester, essentially programming him on how you want him to react, either Welcome. before takeoff or during the climb out to the AO. For example, here I'm setting Jester up so I can manually deploy flares and char from the pilot's Welcome. position. However, if I leave them on the normal standard settings, the second we're engaged by enemy missiles, Jester will automatically deploy flares or chaff as needed. You do not need to open up the radial menu while in combat to tell Jester to deploy flares. It is an automatic setting. Think of the Jester configuration menu as sort of like setting your aircraft up to complete your mission objective en route to the combat zone. It works in exactly the same way. You're just configuring what the Rio will do. Now the exception to this rule is the radar modes, which you will use while at beyond visual range. You'll use the radar radial menu to change the scan range of your radar and to tell Jester to lock targets that are at beyond visual range. However, once you close into dogfighting range, Jester will automatically change the radar into a close range mode that allows the pilot to self-designate targets using the PLM or pilot lock mode button. Otherwise, while engaged in close range combat, Jester will react based upon the settings you gave him on your approach to the target zone. So it's actually really easy to deal with. Anyways, speaking of beyond visual range. Target, 195 miles. Thank you, Jester. Have I mentioned how much I love this plane? Alright, so as I said, today's video is about the Phoenix missile. Unique to the F-14, the AIM-54 Phoenix is a long-range, active radar-guided intercept missile primarily designed for destroying hostile strike aircraft capable of carrying air-launched anti-ship missiles that could potentially threaten the aircraft carrier or her fleet. It carries a 61kg high-explosive warhead, almost three times the size of the warhead on the AIM-120 AMRAM, has a maximum speed of Mach 5, and a maximum range of over 100 nautical miles, or around 190 kilometers, although the maximum range shots are situational. Much like the AMRAM and other missiles such as the Harm, the Phoenix's maximum range depends on a large number of factors. The launching F-14's airspeed, the airspeed and direction of travel of the target aircraft, the altitude difference between the two aircraft, and the rate of closure. Target, 97 miles. While learning the Phoenix, the longest range shot I've personally managed to achieve in DCS is around 75 nautical miles. However, talking to the guys over at Heat Blur, their current record is around 110 nautical miles. So hitting these massive range shots is possible, but it's also very situational. The practical range of the Phoenix seems to be around 50 to 55 nautical miles, or roughly 100 kilometers, against a target that is at a similar altitude or the same altitude as the launching aircraft and not flying directly at the launching F-14, which is still pretty damn impressive, and that is what we're doing today. A hostile Russian bomber is ahead of us, crossing our path at roughly 90 degrees in relation to us, so the only rate of closure on the target is by us. It's under escort from two MiG-23 floggers, we're carrying two of the potential maximum of six AIM-54s currently, and we're going to fire the first at around 50 nautical miles, or just under, while the second just-in-case launch will be released at just under 40 nautical miles. The real point of this? To eliminate the enemy bomber at a range that is beyond the capability of its own escorts to defend against. Target, 71 miles. Thank you, Jester. So at this point, we've locked up the target at close to 200 nautical miles, and we've managed to track it down to 75. The missiles themselves are already ready to launch, so all I'm doing at the moment is watching the VDI, which is the red screen in the center, and the TDI, which is the green screen behind the flight stick, for range information and target information, to make sure we are all good to launch. Oh, and for those that were wondering about the angle of the mirror in the F-14, it is actually in a pretty good spot. You just have to lean in a little bit to be able to see it back there. It's also worth noting that the reason why the mirror is angled the way it is when the pilot is sitting back is so he can clearly see back towards the Rio's position. So in the case of a comms failure inside of the aircraft, the Rio is able to hand signal to the pilot. 
Anyways, we are just passing 50 nautical miles, so we are about to launch. And that will be our Fox 3. Target, 46 miles. So, so the release range on that one was 46 miles. I got this one a little bit shorter than I was expecting. Now I've still got the candles lit, we're still full burn towards the target, and we have been for pretty much all of this flight at this point. The phenomenal fuel load on the F-14 allows for this. And we're going to close this down to just under 40 nautical miles, and then we're going to release the next missile before we break off, throttle back, and observe how the shots go. And you can see by the tail streak on the AIM-54 there, exactly how long the engine on this thing burns. Anyway, time for our second Fox 3. Phoenix away. Now you can't break completely away from the target aircraft on release. The Phoenix takes a couple of seconds, or roughly the amount of time it takes to cross two nautical miles, for the active radar to acquire the target. So for the first few seconds after launch, you must keep the target within around 45 degrees of the nose of the aircraft. Not that we really needed the second Fox 3, the first missile went straight in and picked the target straight out of the centre. And at this point, now with the destruction of the bomber, the enemy fighters are actually starting to react. In a manner of speaking, they're reacting by going home. Now I wasn't just only carrying the Phoenixes, I've got a couple of Sparrows here and I've got a couple of Sidewinders, and I'm not about to have any of that, so Bogey, three, let's go three, get them. Zero, 19 miles, Angels 20, here we go again! And a bogey, bra, 330, 33 miles, Angel 20. Now, at this point, we're still at BBR ranges, which is why I use the radial menu to actually lock this target up. Target, 15 miles. We need to be a little bit closer before PLM comes into play. Now sparrows work exactly the same way on the Tomcat as they do on anything else. You need to keep the nose of the aircraft pointed towards the target aircraft in order for the sparrow to track. Spike, 12 o'clock, slugger, missile, 12 o'clock, hot, brick left. Spike, 12 o'clock, slugger. So of course I dropped the sparrow the second I rolled out to evade the missile. I'm trying not to talk too much here so you can have a good listen to the way Jester calls out when you're engaged in close combat. There are bandits, MiG-23, 12 o'clock, 3 miles, 1 o'clock, Spike, 7 o'clock, 2 o'clock low, 6, We're on a six, closing, six o'clock. Splash. The bandit is down, six o'clock. Bandit is going down. So, as I said in the previous video, Jester calls the fights remarkably well. He's capable of identifying the direction the enemy aircraft is in, whether or not the aircraft is high or low. He can call incoming missiles and even the optimal direction to break in in order to best avoid them. So, for anybody who is worried about that, don't be. He's actually very good. Now, back to the radial menus. One last thing we've got to do here, we've got to go home. And it takes me a few seconds to grab it here, but I'm looking for navigational utilities, select destination, and oh home God. base. Home and this base. will instruct Jester to reset the navigation system to take us back to the carrier. All right, and back at the carrier group, and time for landing. now. This landing wasn't horrible, it was a little shallow. 
I'm actually having a lot of difficulties with this due to the slow speed that the Tomcat comes in at plus the brake altitude onto the glide slope only being at 800 feet and the carrier deck being at 62. It's a very shallow glide path and very easy to drop below. And no jester, that was not a bolter. Small bug, it's known, it's being fixed. If you're wondering why the HUD is a little off-center, however, I can neither confirm or deny that this was my second attempt at landing at the end of this mission, and that the first attempt was actually a bolter, that resulted in me touching down on the carrier deck with enough force to break the gyros in the navigation system again. The damage modeling on this aircraft is remarkable. Anyways, ladies and gents, I hope you enjoyed the video, and thank you very much for watching. As always, remember to check the video description... Well, actually, it'll be in the comment section now, because YouTube apparently doesn't like the links in the video descriptions at all anymore. So check the pinned comment in the comment section down below for links to all of my social media, my Twitch, my Discord, my Patreon, if you'd like to help support the channel. And here comes the wingman. Show off. Anyways, remember to click the like button if you did enjoy this video, hit the subscribe button if you are not subscribed already and you would like to see more of this kind of content, and until next time, fly smart, fly safe, and I'll catch you in the skies.